One by one they came Far as the eye could see Each life somehow touched By your generosity Little things that you had done Sacrifices made I noticed on the earth In heaven now proclaimed And I know up in heaven You're not supposed to cry But I am almost sure There were tears in your eyes As Jesus took your hand And you stood before the Lord It's time to celebrate this incredible season of blessings A most dynamic Jewish holiday The Feast of Tabernacles Direct from the Legacy International Center in San Diego Scheduled speakers, Robert Stearns Rabbi Jonathan Burness Sid Roth, Jonathan Kahn, Kurt Schneider, and our very own Don Mandel. Be tremendously moved by the powerful words of the late Dr. Moore Cirillo as we revisit one of his most anointed messages presented on location in Israel. Special musical guests, Marty Getz and his daughter Misha. This gifted musical team presents original inspirational music direct from Jerusalem. Join with Teresa Cirillo as she participates and shares her thoughts on this great feast, which has tremendous prophetic significance for people all around the world. Discover with her and learn about the sukkah. Learn about the lulav, the four species wave devotionally. Get ready. The Feast of Tabernacles will inspire you, encourage you, and strengthen you. Well, clap your hands, all ye people. Somebody shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on. This is a festival of joy, and the joy of the Lord, I want to tell you tonight, is your strength. Somebody go ahead and just give the Lord one more good hand clap of praise. This has been an incredible five days. Actually, tomorrow is day five, and I want to encourage you, Tomorrow morning, if you are near olive oil, if you're going to be in your home in a place where you will have access to oil, prepare it. We're going to have an incredible closing, anointing, healing, miracle, feast of tabernacles service direct from your legacy center. But right now, we open every service with a special time of prayer. I want to encourage you, those that are watching Use this time and share your prayer requests in the comment section. You can use the phone number on the screen, and a live prayer minister is standing by ready to agree with you in prayer. And you use this time to engage the Lord in prayer. And I want us to join our senior vice president of international ministries, Don Mandel, as he leads us from the Western Wailing Wall here at Legacy. Take a look at this. And in your homes now... How many of you love Israel? If you do, let me see your comment from Israel. Let me see you type, I love Israel. Let me see your comment. Give God a like offering. Hit that like, hit a share, hallelujah. Father, as we commemorate now that our great general, Dr. Boris Rillo, is with you, we have this mandate that the ministry will not die and part and parcel of his life and ministry that you established, Lord, was his unique and multifaceted love for Israel. And so we ignite that in our prayer right now. We ignite that as we pray over every aspect of this, this man that you called out of an Orthodox Jewish orphanage just a year before Israel's independence and then just Right after Jerusalem was taken in 1967, you sent him to Israel. And he's expressed such a love for Israel here at this legacy center. We have the great wings over Israel, which allows visitors, including American Jews, to come and experience. Just the other day, Lord, you sent us one of the leading mega pastors in all America. And he went in there and said it was an incredible experience. And even when missiles were flying, falling all over Israel, Dr. Srillo took his prayer group every year, every year to Israel to stand on the ground and be a blessing. 
and yet he not only blessed, we thank you, but we carry forward that he preached the gospel, and we're going to continue preaching by your grace, Lord. I am not ashamed, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to save all that believes to the Jew first. It doesn't say the Gentiles, and maybe in the sweet by and by, a few of the Jews will get it. It says to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And we thank you, Lord, for all the nationals that he has raised up, that even during this pandemic, they're out winning souls. They're out praying for the sick. They're out manifesting. They're saying like Peter did right in Jerusalem, look on us, look on us. And they're receiving. We thank you, Lord, for the communities that he raised up and imparted and empowered the Filipinos by the thousands in Israel, the Eritreans, the Sri Lankans, hallelujah, the Spanish-speaking Jews, the Arabs, the Sabras, and Lord, especially his great love for the Arabs. We thank you for Brother Cirillo's love for the Arabs that we carry forward, that they are a great part of the end time salvation plan. Oh, Lord, we thank you for all the billions of pieces of literature that are circulating from him. We thank you for all the television outreach that he has done and continued to do and the great infrastructure that our partners have made possible. The largest uh, congregational big structure in Jerusalem, the pavilion that he was a cornerstone of the, corrupt, of the uh, construction and also the uh, glory of Jerusalem and also in Herzliya helping bring out from under the bushel, bring out from under the bushel and lift up and magnify the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah, Nachnum of Rahim. Hallelujah, et am Yisrael. Toda Abba shetiftach et enehem. Tiftach et enehem, kedei shehem yucholim. Lirot et HaMashiach. Lirot e velokeh chelek shel Yerushatam. Hallelujah, shel Yerushatam. Yeshua Adonai. Yeshua Adonai, and for his spiritual perspective to pray and watch in prayer, even as the end time events unfold, even as eventually the sealing of the 144,000, tribe of Judah, 12,000, tribe of Reuben, 12,000, tribe of Gad, 12,000, tribe of Asher, 12,000, tribe of Manasseh, 12,000, tribe of Naphtali, 12,000, tribe of Simon and Levi, 12,000, Issachar, Zebulun, tribe of Benjamin and Joseph, and don't forget the tribe of Dan. We pray for Tel Aviv, we pray for Haifa, we pray for Beersheba, we pray for Elad, and we thank you that every one of you is enriching your prayer life by praying for the peace of Jerusalem, for it says you will prosper that love you, and you are praying for, for Israel, for it is written, he that blesses you, hallelujah, I will bless him that bless you, and he that touches you, touches the apple of mine eye. Hallelujah, Baruch Hashem, hallelujah, thank you. Wow, hallelujah, come on, somebody declare Israel belongs to Jesus, come on, somebody say pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we want to pray for Don Mandel, he is on his way tonight to Tanzania, and we want to ask God to give him traveling mercies, and so, Father, we thank you that you're with Don as he goes tonight, Lord, under this mantle to build your army. God, we declare this ministry will never die. Thank you that you give your angels charge, O oh God, concerning him. Lord, let every place his foot treads, Lord, cause it to prosper, Lord, for the sake of your gospel. And Father, we thank you that greater is he that is with Don and in Don than he that is in the world. And we declare tonight, not only does Israel belong to Jesus, but Tanzania belongs to Jesus and Don Mandel belongs to Jesus. Well, if you love the Lord, if you love Don, go ahead and give the Lord, give Don a good hand clap. What a great job he has done with this incredible first ever Feast of Tabernacles conference. We have something very, very special tonight. Don pulled this from our archives. It's a special never before seen. I don't think anybody has seen this. It's about a 20-minute interview that Pastor Chris 
Oyela Kiami from the Love World Network in Nigeria, a precious, precious man of God that loved Brother Cirillo so very much. His life was impacted through the ministry of Morris Cirillo many years ago. Well, several years ago, as Brother Cirillo was recovering from his and had his incredible miracle of the healing of vasculitis, he was there with Pastor Chris, and they began to share a little bit of the heart of God for his incredible people in Israel. And then, of course, just a few weeks ago, Pastor Chris sent a few words of tribute. So first you're going to see Pastor Chris's words of tribute for Dr. Cirillo, and then this short, never-before-seen interview. So if you're ready, take a look at this. You are watching Pastor Chris in an exclusive interview with Dr. Morris Cirullo. Can I just ask another question? When you, you started at what age? 15. 15. Interesting. Interesting. I started preaching at 15. Really? Yes, sir. That's, I had my first crusade when I was 15 years old. And I've been at it ever since. <laughs> now, when you started at such a young age, did you know that the world was going to turn out the way it did. What did you see? Well, you know, my 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 uh, life is a funny story. You see, my mother was Jewish. My father was Latin. I lost my mother when I was two years of age. She died. My father was a drunkard. He left his family, he deserted us. So the state took over my family. I was the baby, I was two. And um, they determined I would be raised a Jew because my mother was a Jew. And if your mom was a Jew, historically, you were in Israel, a Jew. So I was brought up in Jewish Orthodox orphans. I studied the Torah. I read in the synagogue from the tour. I partook of all the feast days, ceremonies, the rituals. And when I was 15 years of age, hey, Don, you would never have one of those books uh, on uh, My life nice story. Oh no, not that one. Oh, let me see that. One day you will do a story like this. This is my 50th anniversary. It shows all the different, some of the things you know that you got probably five books like this. But this, I made it especially for some of our partners and friends. I'm talking about my life story, Don. Yeah, do you happen to have one? Okay. I, I just finished a, a book uh, called The Legend. And it's the story of my whole life from the early inceptions up until now. And it's very difficult to depict and tell some of the experiences of your life. Uh, 
Now everybody can understand. There is more truth than slogan to the fact that many are called, but few are chosen. In a little Jewish orphanage, God sent a Christian nurse to get a job in the orphanage. Make a long story short, she was there for several years. She said, God, I know you sent me here, but I haven't had a chance to talk to anybody because it's very restrictive. It's so orthodox. And the Lord spoke to Mrs. Kerr and said, why don't you go look out over the window? She wasn't charismatic. She was a Baptist. She looked out over the window. God said, what do you see? She said, I don't see anything, Lord. God said, don't say you don't see anything. Go look again. She went and looked again. She said, I see a little boy. And God said, don't you just say a little boy, because I sent you here to bring him my son's salvation. I was 13. Two years later, I was born again inside the Orthodox Order. And I've had experiences out of the realm of natural phenomena that makes me hesitate to, to talk about them. Because when I was 15, I was taken from this earth, a little Jewish boy. I was put up in heaven. And I saw the same glory of God that moved. And I heard God speak to me. He asked me for my life. I gave it to him and I've never taken it back. 72 years. I can remember when the night I came out of the Orthodox Orphan, I was 15 years of age. No father, no mother. Not a penny in my pocket. I left the orphanage. I just ran away. No, ran away? Yeah, I was being persecuted for my faith. So I just left. It was a, it's another story, but it's too many. So, it was a December night, snow, blizzard, and I walked out. Nothing but the little shirt on my back. I got on a place in New Jersey, which is a main street that runs from New Jersey to uh, to Patterson, East Patterson, New Jersey, per se, it runs all the way down. And it's one shopping center after another. I get on that corner, I'm a little boy, 15 years old. And I threw my hands up in the air. And I cried, God, if there's ever such a thing 
as in Jesus. Up there. I said, please, let him come. And let him be with me right now. <coughs> that was the beginning of my ministry. <coughs> I walked for miles. And I came to a place in front of a theater called Montauk Theater. And standing in front of the theater was the woman that brought me the message of salvation. She was with you right there. Right there. So my life is a, and some things I can't mention, but I had nothing. You were in an orphanage for 13 years. <laughs> You were in the orphanage for 13 years. Yeah. For almost 15 years. Because I, I, I had experience of Mrs. Kerr going to the window. I was 13. Two years later, I was saved. I, re I received Jesus two years later. So that was 15. And then 15 is when I left the orphanage. Now, why am I telling you all these stories? I never sit with anybody and talk like this. <laughs> Thank you, sir. What led you into the healing ministry? Healing ministry? Yes. I knew nothing else but that. From the time I was out in meetings, um, there were a few healing evangelists on the scene. Paul Roberts was one. Tommy Osborne was another. And then there was what we call the voice of healing. And so, I uh, was privileged to run the Voice of Healing with uh, uh, Gordon Lindsay. And, uh, and Gordon used to, uh, I had a big tent uh, for the first five years of my life in ministry. I traveled in a tent and um, Gordon would be my Bible teacher in the daytime services, teaching people how to be healed. And uh, we, knew, we knew nothing. We didn't know anything different. Praise God. So you, that means the Lord led you into an environment of faith and healing. Because yeah. there are others who didn't know anything about this. Yeah. You understand? And they were preachers, but yeah. they didn't know anything about divine healing. Yeah. I didn't know anything but. Was there any conflict between what you had learned in the in Judaism? Because I mean, if you have been taught those things for 13 to 15 years, you've got a lot because that's a formative. Yes, yeah, sure. Did you have any conflict with what you had been taught at the time? And then coming to learn about Jesus? Especially knowing that he was supposed to have been Jewish. I feel how I feel how, how I felt. I 
heard about the miracles of my father. But I never knew the reality of those miracles until I found Jesus. How did you relate to them? Pardon? How did you relate to them? Well, I related them as one example, one uh, prophetic eyesight, maybe, and then the New Testament, seeing that it was possible, that it was true. I, one of the biggest discoveries I made in my life was the, the reality of what God did for my people. You see, I grew up as a little boy. I went to Hebrew school every day. Well, not every day, but almost every day. Went to Hebrew school. And I studied what the Lord did in, for my people. But it never hit me as real. But once I got to say, all those Old Testament supernatural experiences became alive. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. That was the biggest transition up until that time in my life. See, I, I knew of a Moses, you know, but I knew him historically. I knew of Joshua, but I knew of him historically. Good story in the book. But now, when I get saved, when read about Joshua, I was looking at his feet touching the, the every place, the place of his toe, of his feet being put upon. I saw it hit. Yes, that was God's promise. In speaking to the Jews, what one thing, if one, what one thing or what major thing would you say it, to the Jewish mind that Jesus is Christ? You know, I have led many Jews to Christ. Christ. You can imagine in my 55 years, I have an incredible outreach to the Jew. I have published book after book after book. I've distributed books to every home in Israel three times. The Jews do not fear me. They love me. And the reason why is because I love them. And there's that bond of love that's not preaching. It's not browbeating them. Because we know that they're, they're not living up to any of the light that they should. But it's showing them love. The Jew responds to love. And if you love them, You will know what I'm talking about. So I asked, what one thing, how do you say to them that Jesus is the Christ that they've, they've been expecting? How do I, I, I want to understand the thrust of your question. How do I? You know the Jew, yes. generally, yeah. looks forward to the Messiah and in his uh, Judaism and his general understanding that Jesus we talk about mm -hmm. is not the Christ. He's not the Messiah. Yes. So when you 
talk to the Jew, what do you tell them? That this Jesus is the Christ. Well, there's enough Old Testament prophetic words that do the teaching for you. You don't have to convince them. Just let them see it in their own scriptures and there's nothing. They they did they, 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 before you know it, they they did they, 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 they. <laughs> From the Old Testament. Certainly. Yeah. I mean Daniel prophesied right up to the exact time of when the Messiah would be born and how. Can they, if they're going to accept Daniel, they're going to accept the Messiah. But you know, the Jew is a, he's a conundrum because he doesn't have any religion. The Jew is a Jew. He, you, you have, you have the spectrum. You have the extremely orthodox Jew who is crazy. Then you have the reformed Jew who says, I can do anything I want. There's no such thing as sin because I'm a reformed Jew. But I'm going to the synagogue three times a year, but that's it. Why? Because he doesn't have any affinity towards religion at all. So you'll find out that most of those Jews fall in those several categories. Do they feel, those of them who don't really believe in Jesus, do they feel like um, the world has been deceived with this Jewish man, Jesus, with the story. Do they feel the Christians made up this story? No, they don't deny, they don't deny that history records what took place. Mm. You find out that Don, over there, should be over here. Don uh, Mendel is my director of my Jewish outreach. And um, he's been with Papa for 30 years. And uh, he speaks uh, 10 different languages. He's a brilliant man. Are you Hebrew? You speak Hebrew too. Yes, sir. So you're Jewish. That means you understand the questions I'm asking. Yes, sir. Interesting. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I get fascinated by um, the the expectation of the Jew in general. Uh, that's the one who doesn't really know about Jesus in uh, Judaism. Because I've encountered several of them, and just like you said, I tried to talk to them from the Old Testament, because they say they don't believe in the New Testament. They think we made it up. But um, in, in reviewing the what the Bible says about the Jew, for the last days, they will believe. They will come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, the rest of us, have a responsibility toward the Jew. Something.
thing that he carries in his heart that passion for the Lord that love which each one of us must carry because what you see here today is part of his labor these many years around the world preaching the gospel around the world he preached when it was difficult to preach in many countries and with the boldness of the spirit he moved into those nations and thank God for what we have today broken home that's been dead. You are the testimony. We see Jesus in your words. Jesus in your steps. Jesus saying no, you do. They see Jesus in your words. Jesus in your steps. Jesus saying no, greatest manifestation of the power and the glory of the resurrection that the world has ever seen and the time is now. Listen, when it's harvest time, you don't have to struggle. The fruit is there. You just have to pick it. That's all you have to do. Now is God's time. I see the Father. Well, come on, somebody give honor to whom honor is due. There'll never be another Dr. Morris Cirillo. Come on, wherever you are right now, you can use the like button. You can use the heart button. But I want us to take about 15 seconds and just give honor to the one and only Dr. Morris Cirillo. Somebody say this ministry will never die. And I want you to know, Papa, we love you. I miss him every single day. But I tell you what, when I step onto this Legacy Center grounds, I feel his presence. I feel his presence as we go. I tell you what, that anointing is in the earth. That anointing is intensifying. And I believe that there are people today that are candidates for the double portion. We're going to carry this ministry forward by the grace of God. If you believe it, somebody shout amen. Somebody shout Israel belongs to Jesus. What an incredible thing to hear just some of the heart of Brother Cirillo for the nation of Israel over 50 years of incredible ministry in the nation of Israel. Tonight, you can be seated. We have a very, very special treat. This is something that Brother Cirillo 
specially requested when we were planning this Feast of Tabernacles. I remember being in his home during some of the time in the last several months while he was on this earth, and we would be watching Rabbi Kurt Schneider. If you have never heard of him, you are in for a treat tonight. Brother Thrillo was watching Daystar and watching INSP, and he would watch Rabbi Kurt Schneider. I remember a night where we just sat around his table. It was Jerry and I and Morris and Teresa, and he was just drinking it in. And he said, Greg, we have to bring Kurt Schneider to Legacy for the Feast of Tabernacles. And so you're going to be super blessed tonight by special request of Dr. Morris Cirillo. Rabbi Kurt Schneider is coming in just a moment. But tonight we're going to pause and we're going to worship the Lord with our Feast of Tabernacles offering our Vice President of International Ministries, the French voice of Dr. Morris Cirillo, Mark Masson, who co-hosts with Don and I every day on Facebook Live, an incredible man of God, is coming in just a moment, just before he does. I tell you what, I can't get enough of this. This Marty Getz and Misha live from Jerusalem concert is one of the most powerful, precious things I've ever seen. And every one of us that are giving in this incredible Feast of Tabernacles, this is your gift on CD or DVD for your gift of any amount. So just before Mark comes, I want the Lord to be blessed and I want you to give a great welcome to Marty and Misha as they come direct from Jerusalem in Jesus' name. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Hear Yeshua cry How I long to gather you to me Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem Messiah who went for you So should we I will not keep silent for Zion's sake. I'll not hold my peace for Zion's sake. For Yerushalayim, I will not rest. I will not rest. I've set watchmen on your walls, O oh Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace. Day Upon the Lord for Zion's For 
Hallelujah, what a joy, what a privilege to be together in this first Feast of Tabernacle at the Legacy Center. What a joy. We are under an open heaven. You know, when I was um, still at college, when I was 20 years old, um, I lived in Belgium, in Europe. And I was living with, uh, before I got saved, with a Jewish girl. And uh, one day she went back to her country to visit her family. And she called me from Israel and she told me, Mark, um, I believe in God. Oh, I said, that's good. <laughs> me too. <laughs> And then she said, uh, yes, but I believe in Jesus. We never talked about that when we were living together. So I said, Jesus, yeah, me too. She said, yes, but I read the Bible. Bible, Bible. Yes, I have a Bible also. Then she said, yes, but, you know, we won't be able to sleep together anymore. I said, What? I don't know that kind of God. So I took my plane ticket to rescue her from that cult. And when I arrived in Tel Aviv, I met the most amazing messianic community and they witnessed to me the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. And in a few weeks, I surrender my heart to the Lord. And since that beautiful day, August 27, 1985, I am a child of God. Yes, praise God. And God has sent me back there. I, I was baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit and God gave me such a love for the Jewish people and for the nation of Israel. And so when I met, a few years later, the ministry of Dr. Maurice Cerullo, that is full of love and um, compassion for the Jew and for Israel, my heart was already well prepared. Amen? And so the Bible says that salvation comes from the Jew. And I experienced it uh, really, really uh, in my heart. And you say, Dr. Serilo says to the Jew first. And um, we are now preparing an amazing outreach um, to the Jewish people. And your prayer and your financial support are really crucial. And... Um, we really want to bless Israel, and we want to bless the Jewish people with this precious revelation that God gave to Dr. Cyrilo. And remember, the anointing never dies. Amen? Even though Dr. Cyrilo is with the Lord, the anointing that God placed upon his life is still available 
today for you and me, and more than ever, and with even a greater intensity uh, than before. And you know well about the story of Elisha, who after his death raised a dead Hallelujah. So, uh, Dr. Serilo, before he returned to the Lord, he said that he was convinced in his heart that he would win more souls to Jesus after returning to the Lord than during his lifetime. And you know, when God said, I don't want this ministry to ever die, God did not have Dr. Serilo in mind. He had you in mind. Yeah, we, we, we're gonna do the we're gonna do the work of God in our generation. Can I have an amen? amen. And, and today I would like to share with you some divine principle regarding finance and give you a key for your spiritual and financial prosperity. And at the end, we're gonna receive an offering uh, for this amazing feast of tabernacle. And you know. I noticed in my own life, and I noticed in the life of great men and women of God in the Bible, that each time I hear a word from God, whenever I know the Lord has spoken from heaven to my heart, the very first things I want to do is to give an offering. When you have a revelation, when you hear a word of God, the very first thing you want to do is to give an offering. And this is a, an offering that literally seals the revelation so that it will have its full effect in my life or in, the, in your life. And together we are going to look uh, at several stories in the Bible uh, where this principle is clearly taught. Would you like to do that? Yes. Amen. So one of the first great examples concerned the life of Abraham. We read in the book of Genesis in chapter 14 that Abraham had just won a great victory against his enemy. And we read at verse 18 of chapter 14 that Melchizedek, King of Salem brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And we read in the book of Hebrew that Melchizedek, his name means King of Peace and King of Righteousness. And we have that amazing information about him that he had neither father nor mother, neither the beginning of life nor end of life. So we understand that this Melchizedek who came to meet Abraham was Jesus Christ, pre-incarnated. And the Bible says that Melchizedek brought a revelation to Abraham when he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which has delivered thine enemy into thy hand. And so we see that Melchizedek brought to Abraham two revelations. One, that his God possesses all the riches of the world that he would ever need. And two, that God will always give him victory over his enemies and that he would never depend anymore on the arm of flesh, but that he could trust his God for his total provision and total victory. Revelation. And what do we see immediately after that? Abraham gave him the Died. Amen? So you see, revelation leads always to giving. There is another well-known story in the book of King, the second book of King, chapter 4. This is the story of the Sunamite woman. 
the woman that lived in that village called Sunem. And the prophet Elisha often traveled from one city to another city and made a stop over in that village, Sunem. And this woman took pleasure in offering food and drink to the prophet every time he passed by. But one day, she said to her husband, she said, Behold, I perceive that this man is a holy man of God. She perceived. And she said, let us build him a chamber, a, a house. She said, I perceive. And in fact, the real translation is, I have pierced through the veil. She, she saw something that human intelligence cannot catch. But the Holy Spirit revealed her that this man, Elisha, was a holy man of God. And after that revelation, she said to her husband, it's not enough for us just to give him a meal. We are going to build him a chamber. So you see again, revelation leads always to a great offering. There is one story, of course, you know in the New Testament very well. It's about Zacchaeus. Do I pronounce right? Zacchaeus? You know, I'm not American, I'm French. You know that, huh? You understood by my accent, huh? And we read in the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, the Bible says that Jesus Christ told Zacchaeus that he wanted to eat in his house. But after the meal, we hear Zacchaeus saying to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore him for time. So I don't know about you, but... For me, that's the kind of meal I would like to have more often. You know, when at the end of the meal, the person in front of me says, I'm going to give one half of all my riches. And, and we know that uh, Zacchaeus was, was rich. So what happened during those two hours so that at the end of the meal, this man decided to give half of his wealth? What happened? Well, we have the answer in what Jesus responded to him. He said, Jesus said unto him, This day salvation is come in this house. So you see, once again, revelation. He got the revelation that Jesus was his Savior. And then he gave an offering. And you see, those offerings are always great offering because uh, when God is talking to you, these words are going to stay with you and it's going to change your life forever and will enable you to go all the way without giving up. Okay, one more. That's my, that's my favorite story. It's with Mary in the Gospel of Mark chapter 14. Mary came to Jesus who was eating. And she comes with a fragrance of great value, the Bible says. And you see, yeah, those, those, those offerings are always great. So she poured out the perfume on the head of Jesus. And you know that the disciples start to complain, saying, oh, what a waste of money. Uh, but Jesus answered them and said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. And in verse 8, he says something quite strange. He says, she is come aforehand to anoint my body for the day of my burial. What does that mean? She is come aforehand to anoint my body for the day of my burial. 
You know, at that time, when someone died, they embalm. Do you understand embalm? Yeah? The body with perfume, spices, and strips to prevent the body from rotting, to prevent the body to see corruption. And therefore, Jesus Christ said, she has embalmed my body aforehand for the day of my burial. But you say, yes, but we embalm the body when the person is dead, not before. But do you remember three days after Jesus died? Some woman went also to the tomb with spices and perfume and strips. But it was too late when they arrived. You see, Mary had the revelation that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not depending on men, was not depending on perfume, was not depending on strips or human effort to embalm a body, but that the resurrection of Jesus Christ depended only on God who had declared himself in Psalm 16, for you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasure forevermore. So Mary got the revelation that God, God the Father was going to raise Jesus Christ from the dead and that Jesus Christ was her Savior. And you see, revelation leads always to an offering. Amen? Amen. And sorry to say, but there is also a story in the Bible of a man who came to Jesus uh, but did not have any revelation. Do you remember? It's the story of the rich young man who came to Jesus, asked him, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him what to do, and he answered, oh, I have done all these things. And Jesus told him, you still need one thing to be perfect. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. But he was sad at that saying and went away, grieved, for he had great possession. So, no revelation, no offering. Do you see? Do you see that key principle in the Bible? And this afternoon, tonight, if you have heard the voice of God during this amazing Feast of Tabernacle Conference, you need to seal the revelation that you have heard. Because not only you want to give to God an offering of thanksgiving because he has blessed you, but you want those words that you have heard from the Father to stay with you. And you need to seal it. That's the key. That's the key I'm giving you for your financial prosperity. That's the key when you hear a word of God, when those words were saying, oh God, this is the best food this is the best meal I've ever had you, you, you knew it was not something you heard from someone but you knew it was God talking to you God to talking to your circumstance God talking to, to your financial situation or to your health or to your family you need and we need to seal that with an offering and because you see that offering will work for you it's going to work for you that revelation will never leave your life. It will stay in you and it will flow out of you as living waters. Yeah. You won't need to try to remember. You know what I mean, you know? Me, when I leave a meeting and I need to try to remember what the preacher says, I don't like it. But you won't need to remember the words you have heard because not only you have heard them, but you became those words. Amen? 
And the way to do it is by sealing the revelation with an offering. Amen? So, your offering tonight should be proportional to two things. Number one, it needs to be proportional to your prosperity. Amen? And number two, your offering tonight should be proportional to what you have heard from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And because this ministry loves you, we want to bless you. And for any offering amount, we're going to put into your hand, man, I love this man singing and praising God with his daughter over Jerusalem. This is almost heaven. This is almost heaven. And to those who give uh, $50 or more, you're going to receive the CD or the DVD and this beautiful album, Jewish Outreach. You want to be inspired by a man of faith. You want to be inspired by a man that does not take no as an answer. You need to go through this book. And to those who give 100 and more, we're going to add the beautiful Hashem devotional. Amen. The names of God. Hallelujah. So I would like to ask you and all the viewers on the social media just to take uh, some time. Now close your eyes, everybody. I know each one of you, you have received um, an envelope, of, an offering envelope. Uh, if you don't have one, you can just raise your hand. And you at your home, you know how to give. You can press the, um, the, the, the Give Now button or you can uh, send your credit card details. But I would like each one of you now to close your eyes. And I know that for many of you, there is like a conversation taking place between God and you. And uh, because you feel led to give even more than $50 or $100. You, you, you feel like God has, has really talked to you. You know that there is, there is a change in your life because the word you have heard, you have become those words. And as Dr. Serilo told us the very first day, the very first night, he said the same way Jacob fought with God, and was victorious, at the end of his fault, God changed his name. And whatever you have heard during those conferences, you are becoming those very same words. And God wants you to seal it right now with a, a big offering, the best offering you can do in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. And I thank you for this divine principle that does not come from a man, but comes from your word. That each time we hear a word from God, each time we receive a revelation from the nature of God, you are asking us, you are leading us to seal it with a great offering so that not only we give you thanks, but that revelation will stay in us, will be part of our life as we partake to the divine nature. Please make your offering now at your place. Take sometimes follow the instruction on the screen. And for you that are present in the room, please, you can stand up and bring your offering uh, in the basket on the front. May God bless you. I love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, come on, somebody give Pastor Mark another good God bless you. I tell you, I feel the presence of God on this conference tonight. Here's what we're going to do. Rabbi Kurt Schneider is coming in just a moment. But before he does, we're going to go back to Jerusalem for a moment to worship with Marty and Misha. So I want to encourage those of you that are on the phone tonight, and we have hundreds of partners that are joining the Feast of Tabernacles, not just on Facebook and YouTube and all the other platforms, but on the telephone. You can use this time right now to press the star button. You'll be immediately connected to a live prayer minister. Go ahead and worship the Lord with your giving. And if you would like prayer, they'll pray with you. And then when you're done, press the star button again, and you'll be right back here with us in the Feast of Tabernacles conference. We are about to be blessed. Rabbi Schneider recorded this message especially for this conference tonight. He's going to be coming to us direct from a sukkah, bringing an amazing message on the Feast of Tabernacles by special request from Dr. Morris Earl, but right before he does, we're going to go back to Jerusalem. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for Marty and Misha Getz as they come in Jesus' name. Well, we are going to send you out tonight in an appropriate manner with a benediction you may have heard before. It's from the book of Numbers 6, 24 through 26. We pray that this blesses you, that you feel the Spirit speaking to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us on this wonderful evening in Jerusalem. grace and his face shine 
My name is Rabbi Schneider. I'm the host of the international television broadcast, Discovering the Jewish Jesus. Today, I just want to speak a few words about what Dr. Moore Sorello, a blessed memory, has meant to me. His life deeply touches me. I remember as a Jewish person myself, reading his autobiography, and just the way that father took care of him how Morris Cirillo was abandoned, living in an orphanage, and yet the love of God reached down and took a hold of his life in such a tender, complete way. How could one not be moved? Most of us know the scripture that the Lord takes care of widows and orphans. And how much of a better example can we find of that scripture being fulfilled as it was in the life of Dr. Cirillo? We've traveled, our team has traveled to many places in the world, and I can't even say enough how much Dr. Cirillo's life has impacted people in Africa. Every place we go in Africa, they know who he is. I remember one of our first trips to Africa, we had our driver, and every time our driver would pick us up, he had a little cassette that he was playing in his car. It was a teaching from Dr. Cirillo, and we must have heard that same teaching over and over and over. We must have heard that teaching close to 20 times on that trip, the same sermon. And so all I can say today is that the way that the Lord took care of Dr. Cirillo, then raised him up and used him to touch so many people touches me in a very deep and personal way. And we just give thanks to Father and Yeshua for the way he built his kingdom through Dr. Cirillo's life. Shalom uvracha, peace and blessing, friends. I'm excited today. We're going to be doing a show about the Feast of Tabernacles called in Hebrew, Sukkot. I want to welcome my friends today. We've got Noe and Brandon and Jennifer and Ryan. Thank you for joining us today. And we just wanted to try to make this feel a homey to you because this Holy Day Sukkot, it's celebrated just like this. We're inside a sukkah. We're inside a tabernacle. And the reason we're inside this sukkah, beloved ones, is because it reminds us of how the children of Israel lived in temporary booths or shelters when they were journeying in the wilderness for 40 years as they came out of Egypt and were waiting to enter the promised land. And so every year, the Torah commands us as the children of Israel to celebrate this holy day, Sukkot, and to build these temporary shelters, individually called a sukkah, plural called Sukkot, to remind us that when we were in the wilderness as the Hebrew people for 40 years, we had nothing but Hashem. We had nothing but God. And yet, even though having nothing but God, we had no insurance policies, we had no jobs, we were completely dependent upon Hashem for food every day. Remember, for 40 years, God sent the manna on the ground six days a week, supernaturally. He sent the quail later in the day. And Israel was supernaturally sustained like this for 40 years. And so the point today, whether you're Jewish, or whether you're a Gentile that knows God through King Jesus, the application is the same for everybody, Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah, that even beloved ones, and I really want you to take this to heart, even if we lost everything in life, as long as we still have God, we will be okay because he will supply every single one of our needs. And you know, Ryan, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but I remember years ago, and I was celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles of Cult one year, and I was outside in my, in, on my back uh, porch, the same house I'm living in now, and I had a sukkah built, and I was sitting in the sukkah, and I was at a place in my life, Ryan, I was just kind of stressed, because I was thinking at the time about all that I was doing to keep things going, and I was getting burned out with feeling like if I stopped, everything would fall apart. Yeah. And I had to say to myself, Lord, I need to get out of the cycle thinking it all depends on me. Mm -hmm. And I need to start depending on you and trusting you. Yeah. Even as you took care of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, I, needed to sur I need to surrender this burden that I'm carrying, mm -hmm. that it all depends on me. 
and start trusting you. And I can honestly say, that was like a crisis in my life. For some reason, a freedom came into me just through that realization of being able to give the burden to God, to trust Him to go before me, that really, really made a difference. What do you guys think about that? Is that, does that, um, have you guys ever thought about this or um, maybe never even in reference to Sukkot before, yeah. but just this whole concept of, you know, God had, uh, the, Is the Israelites had nothing but God, and yet He was enough. Yeah. Whoa. How does that, how does that, how do you process that today, anybody? Well, thinking about it, it, it actually uh, reminds us how uh, dependent and um, how focused that our relationship with God should be comparing it to how Israel dependently looked to God in the wilderness as we're transitioning through this life. He's looking at this as our wilderness and our process to the promised land is being dependent upon him. Amen. So it helps me when I think of that. Amen. You know, I remember going through another difficult time in my life some years back and thought, if I lose everything, I'll still have Jesus. And that realization was like, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And that's a freeing revelation. So that to me is, a, is, is an introduction to my really entering in personally, for me, what I consider to be part of the depths of experiencing the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. This realization that Israel for 40 years had nothing but God. They lived in, I mean, look at this here. Yeah. I mean, you would not hire an architect to build this. Yeah. You know, they're building a house on a, 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 not too far from me now. And Cynthia and I took a walk the other day to look at the house. I mean, it's gorgeous. They got all this stuff, you know, all these modern amenities. Uh, they've got a two-car garage. But you know what? We don't need any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. If God took it all away, if he stripped us of everything, we might be happier then than we are right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's reassuring to think about God being able to sustain you and just trusting in him. Yeah. yeah. You know, you think, Ryan, along with what you're saying about, we, we, we've seen testimonies, uh, you know, oftentimes in the news of communities that get hit with a natural disaster. Yeah. You know, a hurricane happens or a flood happens and, you know, people's homes are destroyed and there's no electricity. And the whole community starts coming together to help each other. And they're given these testimonies. It was such a time of friendship and of fellowship and of community and such a beautiful time of people coming together. And you get the sense from what they're saying that they're actually feeling a deeper richness in everybody coming together, yeah. even though they lost everything else. They have they lost their homes, yeah, yeah, yeah. but there's something else that they received. But listen, I don't want to get too far off the main biblical text. So let's go to the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus today. And I'm going to be reading from the 23rd chapter. I'll begin here at the 40th verse, just to set the stage for the biblical precedent of the Feast of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but Baruch Hashem, the word of the Lord, beloved ones, abides forever. Hear the word of God. Now on the first day, you shall take for yourself the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice, that's a key word, because this particular feast is about rejoicing. Mm. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So this feast is seven days, and there's an additional day added on at the end that is considered to be part of it. Verse 41, you shall thus celebrate it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. So it happens the same time every year. It's the seventh month on God's holy calendar. And we call it in Hebrew, the month of Tishrei. Yeah. And it's interesting, during this seventh month, not only do we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, but previous to the Feast of Tabernacles, we begin in the seventh month called Tishrei by celebrating Rosh Hashanah mm -hmm. called uh, Yom Truah, which is the Feast of Trumpets. That begins this holy fall season. The Feast of Trumpets, if you watch my earlier episode, speaks of the coming of the Lord Jesus, the announcement of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. 
And then 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets, we celebrated Yom Kippur, or the Day of Covering, the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. It's a time where Israel recognizes the consequences of sin, that blood must be shed. And today we realize that this day was fulfilled in the shedding of Yeshua's blood. And then following Yom Kippur, we have this crown holy day in the fall called Tabernacles. This is a feast of celebration because we've been through the Feast of Trumpets, recognizing that God is going to judge the world and we need to be ready. Mm. We've been through Yom Kippur where we recognize the consequence of sin. Mm -hmm. And now since we're through repentance, we're through atonement, now we're celebrating with the Feast of Tabernacles. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, the original context was it took place again in the fall, and it was the time of the last fall harvest in Israel. So one of the things that was going on is the Israelites were thanking the Lord. They were thanking the God of Israel for his provision for the fall harvest. And they were also looking forward with anticipation Mm -hmm. for the coming winter rains so that they could have a big harvest again in the spring. So it's a time of rejoicing, of anticipation of future blessing. Mm. Let's continue on. The 42nd verse, the Lord continues, he said, you shall live in booze, okay? Sukkot or singular sukkah, that's what we're sitting in right now. You shall live in booze for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booze. And so today, all over Israel during the Feast of Tabernacles, you'll see people living in these individual booths. So that your generations, here's the reason why we're commanded to live in booze, so that your generations might know that I had the sons of Israel live in booze when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord, your God. So it's a time of remembrance. God is saying, listen, approximately 3,500 years ago, you, my people, We're living in these temporary booths in the wilderness as I was bringing you into the promised land. I don't want you to forget that. I don't want you to forget who you are. And I don't want you to forget that I'm your God. And I want you to remember that you yourselves know what it's like to suffer and to be hungry and to be be discriminated against as you were in Egypt. And I never want you to forget that because I want you to treat everybody else on earth in the same way that you know that you should have been treated when you were being abused. And so built into Jewish ethics and Jewish society and into the land of Israel today is a great spirit of democracy where where the underprivileged are being taken care of because Israel themselves knows what it's like to be the underprivileged and the underdogs. So the Lord continues. He says, so Moses declared to the sons of Israel, verse 44, the appointed times of Yahweh, of the Lord. Now, with that said, what I'd like to do is to make some application, some modern day uh, principles that can be applied to our lives today. As we're thinking about the Feast of Tabernacles, you're watching the show today. Uh, Some of you are actually building a sukkah on your own property, Baruch Hashem, praise God. It's a beautiful thing to do, to be able to sit out here and and look through the roof. You can see that the roof, you can see through it. And the reason that we leave the roofs semi-transparent is so that at night we we can look up through the roof, we can see the stars. And when we look into the sky, it reminds us of of Hashem, it reminds us of God, how we're under the the, the authority of a creator. And we just begin to thank him that, that, you know, we live in an earth where where God is here and he's taking care of and providing for his people. So some of you will actually build a sukkah, others will not, but you're interested in applying the principles of this to your life today. And... I want to speak to all my beloved uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, especially I'm speaking for a moment to those of you that are Gentile and are not going to be uh, necessarily building a sukkah. I just want to stress that there is real opportunity for blessing for you in understanding this holy day, because when the Lord introduced this day, he didn't say this was a Jewish holy day. The Lord said, this is my appointed day. So he said, this is my Yahweh speaking, he said, this is my appointed day. And so because this is Father God's appointed day and you've been grafted in 
to a relationship with him, into covenant with him through Messiah Jesus, that those that were once far off, the Lord says, speaking of the Gentiles, have now been brought near through the blood of Jesus, that the dividing wall that separated the Lord from Gentile people has been broken down. Now Jew and Gentile are one in Messiah. And so now, because you're one with Hashem through Jesus, His holy days have application for your life today. So there's principles that when applied to our life can become opportunities for spiritual blessing. We're not under the law, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater because the law is God's self-revelation and there's an opportunity for us to be blessed. This is why Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 13, he said, every scribe, and a scribe was a Jewish teacher that knew the Torah, And he said, every scribe that becomes a disciple of mine will be like the owner of a mansion that's able to bring forth from that mansion treasures old and new. In other words, that as New Testament believers, there are treasures for us, both in the New Testament, the Birch Hadashah, but also in the ancient writings in the Torah. This is why Jesus said, do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, for I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now, I know, Jennifer, you're uh, someone that really has kind of embraced this whole uh, Hebraic concept as a Gentile in your life, not as someone that's under the law, but just as someone that you just appreciate it because you love God. And, you know, just because you love him, this kind of love for who he is as the God of the Hebrews and the revelation that he gave us in the Hebrew Bible, you know, is just something that's close to your heart. And I know that you've celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles before in your congregation. When you think about the Feast of Tabernacles, what to you warms your heart? I think to me, um, especially the message that God dwells with us, even despite our sin, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you know, coming off of like Yom Kippur and many people out there are feeling really sorrowful for their sins. They don't believe that God loves them. They don't Mm -hmm. believe anymore that God, you know, they believe God abandoned them. Mm. And to me, to know that Christ died for us, to know that it's not just a conditional thing. You know, you sinned once and, oh, okay, now you sinned 400 times. I'm leaving you now. Mm. But rather that he died and he paid the price for our sins. Mm. And to me, like um, when said God dwells with us, is that he never leaves us or forsakes us. Wow. You know, I'm thinking, Jennifer, in relationship to what you're saying, Israel was in the wilderness how long, Brandon? 40 years. years. And do you know for 40 years, every single day, visibly, the Spirit of God manifest Mm. as a divine fire in the nighttime that rested over the big Mishkan, the big tabernacle that, uh, that housed the Ark of the Covenant. And then when the day came, the fire turned into a glory cloud. So for 40 years, Israel literally saw the presence of Hashem dwelling with them. And so, yeah, and and, and, and Israel, as long as the fire and the cloud, the glory cloud remained over the, the, the Mishkan, the main tabernacle that housed the Ark of the Covenant, which housed the Ten Commandments, as long as the fire stayed over it, they camped in that same location. But whether it was sometimes two days Sometimes it was two months, sometimes two years. Eventually, the fire and the cloud would lift and move. Mm -hmm. And whenever the fire and the cloud lifted and moved, the children of Israel picked up camp, Mm -hmm. and they followed the fire and the cloud wherever it moved to. But they never knew when it was going to move and where it was going to move to. And so it's not only about God dwelling with us, but it's about us dwelling with Him. Because if they would not have moved when the fire moved or when the cloud moved, you know what would have happened? They would have ended up dying where they were. Because there was only provision when they found the, 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 the manifestation of God's presence. And so that really speaks to us of the, the importance of being flexible in our lives. To experience God's dwelling with us, we can't you know, put God on our terms and say, well, God, uh, you know, um, I'll go with you uh, next week. I I think I'll be in a better mood. And Lord, uh, I'm not really quite ready to obey on that one, but just hold tight, God, and uh, be on standby. And I'll let you know when I'd like to talk further. No, it's like when he moves, (laughs) we've got to move. And if we don't yield and follow, we'll perish. We'll die. We'll end up withering in our spiritual life 
and potentially end up being separated from God. I want to read verse number 40 for you once again. It says, now on the first day, this is the first day of, of Sukkot, now on the first day you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So the children of Israel were commanded to take the species of different uh, agricultural products from the land that represented the beauty and the bounty of the Lord. And this is called the lulav, the willow, the palm, the etrog. And we wave it before the Lord like this in all directions, up and down, up and down, thanking God, representing that everything that we have comes from Him, every good gift that we have, the loved ones in our life, the food on our table, the roof over our head, whatever health we have, every provision that we have in life has come to us as a gift from God. And so during the Feast of Tabernacles, during the Feast of Sukkot, we wave the lulav, once again, representing the beauty and the bounty of the Lord that comes into our life. We wave it in recognition and in honor of the fact that every good gift that we've enjoyed in our life has been a gift from Hashem. I mean, think about it, Jennifer, even the breath that you're gonna take right now. Isn't every breath that we take really a gift from God? Absolutely. I mean, really, we didn't do anything to create ourselves, right? I mean, the beauty that we experience just being with each other, looking at these beautiful people today that I'm surrounded with, the love that we enjoy, the friendship, you know, that we've established. Where does friendship come from? You know, where does love come from? It's all a gift from, from God. And so the Lord said that during this particular time of year, we should remember that and not take it for granted. So many people today, you know, they're willing to, 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 to enjoy, for example, the, the beautiful nature that even we're surrounded in now, but they don't give God credit for creating it. Mm. You know, it's just like, oh, aren't those mountains beautiful? Oh, I don't believe in God, but I love those mountains. Mm. Oh, I don't believe in God, but aren't those birds beautiful? It's like that's the, the, the spiritual mindset that's seeping over the earth right now. But we're a called out people, amen? Yeah. We say, God, thank you for the beauty. You yeah. created it. Thank you for my loved ones. Thank you for whatever's good in my life. So this is a time to rejoice. And actually, uh, Ryan, I love what, what this verse says here. We sometimes don't realize that it says in verse 40, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And do you know, at another place in the Torah, the Lord actually brought a curse, a penalty upon his people because they didn't rejoice before him yeah. when he was doing good things. Yeah. And he said, because you didn't rejoice and weren't grateful to me when I blessed you, mm. now I'm gonna send a curse upon you to teach you gratitude. Yeah. So it's important to consider. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but for myself sometimes, you know, just being flesh and, you know, being corrupt, yeah. I have to sometimes snap myself out of it. Yeah. Like, you know, my wife, Cynthia, has to tell me a lot of times, you are a blessed man. Yeah. And I have to say, yes, you are right. Because God could take all this away any yeah. second. Yeah. You know, and it's so easy to think about the glass being, you know, half, half empty. Well, anything anyone would like to add today? It's reassuring that he wants us to be happy and he wants us to rejoice and, yeah. and be thankful for him and reminds us of that. That's a really good point. That's a really powerful point. You know, and when you're saying that, Ryan, it, it makes me think about the war that we're in. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying, just knowing that God wants us to be happy, yeah. He wants us to rejoice, and recognizing, you know, we're up against darkness yeah. that doesn't want us to be happy and yeah. doesn't want, and we have to make that choice to get an agreement. Amen. It's a good point. It's interesting how um, he ties rejoicing with reminding what he's done in our lives mm -hmm. for what he wants to do going forward. And so connecting with the fact that our rejoicing reminds us of all the victories that he's brought us through, preparing us for whatever we have to go through beyond that point. Good point, because this feast yeah. is a celebration of the fall harvest. It was yeah. the last great harvest in Israel for the year, 
before winter came, because this is the, this is the fall feast and the last one. But part of the celebration of this feast takes place on the last day of it. It's actually written about in the Gospel of John chapter 7. It was called the Great Day of the Feast, and there's a special ceremony that took place in this day called Hoshana Rabbah, which was a water pouring ceremony. And what happened was that everyone would gather together at the temple and there'd be a big processional of the priest and they'd be singing and dancing. They would walk from the temple down to the pool of Siloam. And then when they got to the pool of Siloam, the priest would take a pitcher, he would dip it into the, into, into the waters of Siloam, and then they would begin to walk back to the temple. And everybody would be singing and praising and dancing. We have all types of historical records of this. In fact, the, the ecstasy of the celebration and the rejoicing was so intense that we have writings of rabbis doing cartwheels and praising God while they were standing on their head. And the question is, well, why? You know, what was going on? And the reason is, on this last day of Sukkot, when they took that water from Siloam to the temple, they would then, when they got to the temple, at the height of the rejoicing and the praise, the priest would then pour the water on the altar at the temple, and that's when the, when the praise would reach its crescendo. And the reason is that that water that was being poured out on the altar at the temple, it represented the rain that Israel was expecting God to bless them with in the coming winter months so that that would in turn give them a great new harvest in the spring. So it was rejoicing for what the Lord had already done, but it was also a confidence in what Hashem was going to do for them in the future. There was an expectation of future blessing. And by the way, it also represented the confidence they had that the Lord was going to be sending Messiah, and that when Messiah came, water would be poured out, spiritual water on the people. Of course, we know that Yeshua was right there in the midst. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Yeshua cried out in John 7, if any man is thirsty, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, as the water is being poured out, he says, if any man's thirsty, come to me and drink, and rivers of living water will spring forth from your innermost being. So it's important. I mean, it's good to just yeah. talk about this together because we're in a battle. Yeah. I mean, with, with everything that people are facing in the world right now and the ugliness in society that we're yeah. seeing right now, just a lot of divisiveness that we've experienced and, and so on and so forth, we need to remind ourselves that yeah. God's a good God. Amen. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to rejoice. And so I want to thank you, Lord, that these feasts that we celebrate every year, they bring us back into spiritual alignment. Ooh. You see, these feasts, these holy days of the Lord, these seven holy days, plus the Sabbath, it's like an opportunity for a spiritual tune-up. It's like your car eventually, you know, it starts, so the timing starts getting off. Yeah. So it needs to be readjusted. Yeah. So celebrating these holy days is an opportunity for us to say, yes, thank you, Lord, for my salvation on Yom Kippur, that my sins are forgiven. The Feast of Trumpets, thank you, Jesus, that you are coming back soon, yeah, yeah, yeah. etc. Well, listen, before we run out of time, beloved ones, let's get into some specific applications from the Feast of Tabernacles for your life and my life, for our life today. Number one, the Feast of Tabernacles teaches us to walk in an attitude of dependency. Yeah. Because when you think about it, Jennifer, every single day, six days a week, the children of Israel had to rely on the Lord for new manna. What happened if they tried to hang on to yesterday's manna? It rotted. It, got, it became foul. It only lasted for a day. So every day they were dependent. Every single day it had to be a new thing. And so I think about this concept of, of clinging to God, how important it is to cling to God, of being dependent, of trusting Him. And without that, that attitude of dependency, there's like, there's not an open door in our, in our soul for him to move through. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think about Moses and how Moses, when the Lord said, I want you to deliver my people from Egypt. And, uh, and, and Moses said, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. Mm -hmm. Now, I, 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 that's kind of how I feel in my life. It's kind of like, Lord, yeah. if you're not going to be with me today, yeah. kill me now. <laughs> because I, 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 I know that without you, I'm just a victim. I'm just like out here, you know, a target for the enemy. Yeah. So we live in this concept of, of dependency on the Lord every day yeah. 
for our provision, for our health, for our safety, for our protection. Now this guy right here, he's really dependent right now because he's got another little one coming into his, his home in a few days here. So he's like, he's walking in fear and trembling and dependency <laughs> with, the, with all the extra juggling of the blessing that the little one's going to bring. But uh, we are walking in dependency, amen? amen? All right, let's go to the next one. I love this concept that one of the things that Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles teaches us is that we need to cultivate a mindset where the unseen realm becomes more real to us than the seen realm. Because the children of Israel, they were relying on an unseen God. You know, everything that they were receiving was coming from this unseen God. And yet he was more real to them than everything else. Now I think about you know, application, and we've all heard, uh, because I know all you here, you know, are taught in the Word, how many times have we been taught that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the unseen, invisible forces of spiritual wickedness, right? We're taught that, that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the, the realm of the material world. It's against an unseen force of wickedness. But if I look at my own life, I have to consider myself a big failure many times because I look at situations and I think my problem is the circumstance and I'm dealing with flesh and blood in my thinking rather than recognizing my problem is not the circumstance. It's not in what I see. My problem is in the unseen realm of my thought, which comes from the realm of the spirit. So to be able to make that shift to recognize that our real battle and what's real in life is not what's visible. What's really going on is what's invisible. And you know, it's not going to be long. I'm 62 years old. I'm going to be off this planet. I mean, it's going to be like, what happened to that guy? He's gone. He's here today, gone tomorrow. You know, it's like all this that we thought was real. I mean, uh, there's so many people, you know, the older we get, the people are here today like a vapor in the wind. They're, They're gone. All these people have come and gone. Mm-hmm. It's not what's visible that's real. It's what's invisible that's real. And that's what we need to be living for. Any thoughts on that before we move on to our next point today? Yeah, I was thinking the, um, the struggle, oftentimes I'm reminded of that even we have in our flesh, um, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not even wrestling against us when we fail or when we sin or uh, oftentimes we think it's just us, but we're being fought by forces and powers that we can't see. And so uh, that verse of scripture, often I'm reminded, I'm not wrestling against me. I'm wrestling against forces of darkness. So. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Brandon, as you're saying that, even even the consequences of sin and, and how we sometimes deal with those consequences. And once again, it gets back to the unseen realm and the fact that we process things wrong. Because the truth is we know that the Bible says if we sin, I'm not talking about people that lead a lifestyle of willfully sinning and are not caring about God. I'm talking about people that love God and are striving, but still they fall and fail at times in their quest for perfection. In their journey to perfection, we still fall and fail and stumble at times. And sometimes what happens is, rather than believing that Jesus still loves us, that we're forgiven, instead we get all this self-accusation, this shame, this self-condemnation, and we think it's coming from our own mind, and it's really, it's just a plot of the enemy. So yeah, so Sukkot teaches us that we need to be recognizing that the real battle is in the unseen realm. You know what's another great principle about Sukkot that I think you guys will love? Is that it really equals and levels the playing field for humanity. You know, in, in, in the wilderness, you didn't have some Israelites living in mansions and other Israelites, you know, living in, in, in flimsy, you know, tents with holes through their roof. They all lived in the same kind of structures. Everybody was equal. You know, they all ate the same food. They all had the same manna. They all had the same quail. And it really shows us that before the Lord, we're all just human beings and we're all the same and we need to respect all humanity. And 
Sukkot really teaches us this. It just like it, it equals the, 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 the playing field. In fact, one of the keys of Judaism is to never hate a fellow Jew. It is built into Jewish identity, even though we know that st still there's a lot of arguing amongst the Jewish people. There always has been. But the teaching is that the actual temple was destroyed because there was, um, there was senseless hatred, Jew versus Jew. This is what part of rabbinic teaching. And uh, so, so, so during Sukkot, Jewish people really strive to cultivate this attitude of love for each other, love for the Jewish people, love for fellow Jews, and even to entertain strangers. That you, it's, it's a custom during Sukkot to invite a stranger into your sukkah and have a meal with them. And so I kind of love that concept, just brotherhood and humanity and, and loving each other and, and respecting people regardless of their position in life. Uh, and lastly today, as I close, I'd like to bring up one more uh, principle here. And that is, is that the Feast of Tabernacles cultivates an end times mindset. Yeah. Because as I was indicating on the last day of the Feast of Sukkot, the priest would take water from the Pool of Siloam and pour it on the altar at the temple. And everybody would just go ecstatic in their praise to the Lord. And one of the reasons for that is because the water being poured on the altar symbolized the water that would be poured out upon the earth by the Spirit when Messiah came. And so today we recognize that uh, the Feast of Tabernacles carries with it a mindset of Messiah's coming. And in fact, in the book of Zechariah, the Bible tells us that during the Millennial Kingdom, Jew and Gentile alike will worship the God of Israel and the Father of Yeshua together during the Feast of Tabernacles. This is Rabbi Schneider, along with my friends to today, saying Chag Sameach, happy holidays, and I love you. In the book of Numbers, chapter six, the Lord told Moses and Aaron, speak these words over my people, and I will place my name upon them and bless them. Yavarech Yahweh, Vayishmarecha. Yair Yahweh, Penavelecha, Vichunecha. Yisa Yahweh, Penavelecha. Ve'asem lecha. Shalom. May Father God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord your Father lift you up by his countenance. And Father God is gonna continue his beloved child to give you his peace. Well, come on, why don't we just go ahead and give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. I want us to take 30 seconds and just go ahead and rejoice before the Lord. You can open your mouth. Just begin to thank him for his goodness. Begin to thank him for his provision. Begin to thank him for his presence tabernacling with us. Lord, we did not choose you, but you chose us. Somebody that says, God, thank you for choosing me. I want you just to go ahead and just thank him. Fernando, Apostle Fernando, I want you to come. I want you to close us in the mighty name of Jesus. Let everything that has breath praise the living God, my God. Father, we thank you. We rejoice, O oh God. You are a good God. Your mercy endures forever. You have not given up on us. God, you have not left us. You have not forsaken us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Lord, we are just so grateful to today. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We enter your courts with praise. And Lord, we thank you that you tabernacle with us, oh God. Lord, that you became flesh and literally dwelt among us. And Lord, we love you today. And we lift our voice to worship you. Somebody go ahead and give the Lord a mighty shout of praise. Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo! 
My, 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 Oh, Lord God, we thank you. You know, we, oh, hallelujah. You know, it's almost the last day. You know, the last day is tomorrow. That's the day when there's going to be a special, don't forget, that was, that, that served, that, that service of the water was a break forth service. The pool of Siloam, which is the Gihon River from Genesis 2.10, there will be a break forth and a break out and a breakthrough tomorrow. I am telling you, you better get ready. That's when Jesus stood up and said, let those who thirst come after me. And there's going to be an anointing of oil service. Holy oil will come upon you tomorrow. I can guarantee it in the name that is above every other name. Because this place, the Legacy International Center, took a step of faith. And God is going to bless us with fresh holy oil. I can hardly wait. I'll be right there. Anoint. Oh, my God. Father, let's just rejoice ahead of time for God, we thank you, oh God. <laughs> we thank you for that fresh holy oil. We thank you, oh God, for this celebration, oh God. Arrebesondo, arrebesondo. We thank you for dreams in the night, oh God. You will visit us, oh God, as we celebrate you, God, as we rejoice. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We rejoice in the Lord. Every nation and every tongue, there will be an anointing upon you tomorrow. It is the last day of the feast. We believe, therefore we will receive. Hallelujah. Somebody shout, hallelujah. Hey. Well, somebody shout, hallelujah. Well, we just want to say how much we love you who are watching, those of you that are on the phone, and then you fanatics that are here at the Legacy Center. You are amazing, and I tell you what, we are receiving something. I want to encourage you that are here, make sure you get into the sukkah. I'm sure that you've done it, but do it every day and just celebrate the presence of God, celebrate the provision of God, celebrate the goodness of God, and how I thank God for Morris and Teresa Cirillo that would have a vision, first of all, for a place like this, was, which was really built for you and for me and for their children and grandchildren and our children and grandchildren and until Jesus comes. But to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles at Legacy, I tell you what, there are many people that would love to be here doing what we are doing. And so we just want to thank God. Why don't we just go ahead and thank him one more time. What a privilege it is for us to be able to stand on these grounds. And I just want to uh, remind you tomorrow morning, like Fernando, Apostle Fernando reminded us, will be the anointing service. It will be at 9 o'clock. It's going to be incredible. We got a little special surprise Pastor Steve Muncy called uh, Sister Teresa just a few days ago, and he said, you know, I, want to, to, I wanted so much to be at Legacy for the Feast of Tabernacles. And so he sent a little message. It's only about 15 minutes or so, but he sent it for the uh, service tomorrow, for the anointing service. So be, uh, be excited, be expecting uh, God to do something great to seal this great Feast of Tabernacles conference with an impartation, with an anointing, with uh, just a greater revelation. I'll tell you what, it's been great to hear messages like we heard tonight. How many of you were blessed tonight? I tell you what, what a great God we serve. And listen, God loves to be celebrated. And uh, he, he told us the joy of the Lord is our strength. Not the mourning and, all, you know, all, woe is me, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. So go forth Enjoy. Here's what we're going to do as we're dismissing and as we're saying goodnight to everybody on Facebook and YouTube. We're going to go out with one more incredible opportunity to be with Marty Getz and uh, Misha. I do want to encourage those of you that are watching. I know those of you here, you have given and given, and I know you're going to be getting your DVD and CD copy, but if for some reason you're just joining us and you haven't sown your Feast of Tabernacles offering yet, I want to encourage you just to do it because the Word of God commands us to do it. God wants to do something greater for you. God wants to release something greater into your life as you 
you commemorate him. And we also want to send this to you as our gift for your offering of any amount for this Feast of Tabernacles. The full Marty Getz and Misha live from Jerusalem concert. We'll see you tomorrow as we go out. Take a look at this and be blessed. Since the day that you were born and I became your daddy, I hope someday to write for you a song. And though you know I love you so, that song was never written. And in a moment all these many years have come and gone So day by day I stood amazed at the girl you were becoming So full of life So sweet So strong So smart And your dear old dad he'd never had one single day of trouble with a child who was a joy right from the start. Still, I wish I were a daddy who could dance with Cinderella. And I pray somehow you know, I hope you dance for a father father his pleasure in his baby's laughing eyes and in her playful cries when she's kissed by butterflies every father wants to be a hero to his daughter he'll do anything to show her that he cares but sometimes best that he can do is put some food upon her table tuck her in and help her say her prayers and somehow now you stand before me, such a beautiful young woman, and still inside my heart there is a fear that I never found the way to praise the bestest daughter ever, so though I know I'm overdue. I wrote this song for you. Your hand today I give away to the one you call your husband. He's a good man and I know he'll love you well. But more than that, I give you to your daddy who's in heaven. For he's the one you're trusting on this day you say I do. And one thing I'm certain of. Only he could have more love than this daddy.